spring has sprung here in Lamerton. No, see, we're sort of on the outskirts of Lamerton. And here we are um, with Rohit's Fender Telecaster, made in Mexico. Um, I've forgotten the exact model, but it's the one with the two um, and the curls. And it's in for a setup to make it as good as it can be. Now, two things I've already done off camera while I was waiting for batteries to charge. The first one is I have um, tightened up this jobby. This is one of these, I hate these sockets. They are kind of jammed in, in a way that it's impossible, almost impossible to get them out. Well, I've never had any good success. So it was loose and they're also so far in, that it's really difficult to tighten up. But courtesy of those two implements there, I was able to do it. So that's tightened back up. It was very wobbly before. The other thing I've done off camera is I've put an E-string on, which broke. But I've also uh, filled and repaired this ding here. And now it's now refusing to focus. See, Whoop, there we are. Now, I don't. You won't be able to see it from here, but this looks. It looks like it's a, a ding still because it's basically it's a ding that's been. I can't make this work. I'm, yeah, messing about with the lighting now. Um, hello, lighting, come back to normal, please. Um, anyway, sorry. Um, so this thing has been filled and polished out. So you can see it's like, it's smooth. There's no, um, it's, imagine a pothole in the road filled with glass. You can see there's a tiny little bit missing in the corner where I didn't quite get enough glue into it. But, um, other than that, it's smooth as anything, so you don't even feel it. <clears throat> so, but you can't make them invisible, that's the problem. Um, there's no way you can fill it with, unless you had the exact same paint, you may, but actually, funnily enough, getting some paint in there, hardening it off, and then getting some clear on top of that would be really difficult. So I've gone for just leveling it off and um, just polishing it out, and you can see it's very smooth indeed. Um, there's a bit of finger glue on the other side. Um, but yeah, anyway, so those are those two things, three things, plus the string. So everything else about this guitar is nice condition Fender. Um, Rohit's, one of Rohit's questions is, what could I do to improve it? Um, and first thing I noticed on this guitar, as I commented on a previous post on Facebook, is that the board has shrunk slightly, or the neck has shrunk very slightly, and the result is that the uh, the tangs are slightly sticking out and with the tangs sticking out uh, it pushes the end fills out so I'm going to need to uh, mm, come on you can get into focus I'm going to need to file those off um, but actually the, the strings springs strings frets are quite a little bit sharp anyway so I will hold off doing those just now until we've done any other fret setup work because I think the um, I think the It'll need a bit of time with a file and maybe a little bit of sandpaper just to round this off before we get into polishing out the frets. So with this, I'm going to fit a tusk nut here and slack that angle back down. It doesn't need to be as low as that, but it also can do with the tusk. I think this is a micarta thing. Now, I'm going to go, it's beautifully fitted and everything. I'm going to go on the basis that if it isn't broke, I'm not going to necessarily fix it. Sorry, that's got finger and clear polish kind of buffing solution buffing compound that's the one uh, anyway yeah so I'm going to go if it's not broke it doesn't need to be fixed although right now the action is very low over here which is cool over the first fret and we're going to just check out the action over the last fret Rohit asked me about you know did I think that uh, they, there was a need to upgrade anything else or an open question what what could I upgrade on this and to be honest these are perfectly good enough uh, the tuning stability will be about the nut and the stretched out slack in the strings. Um, it's a bit of compound still around. Um, yeah, so it won't be to do with the tuners. These Fender tuners are perfectly good. I wouldn't waste money going for anything else. And to be honest, I wouldn't waste money going for locking tuners. I am not a great fan, as some people will know, for a number of technical reasons. Um, equally, it then comes down to do you, well, Sorry, rewind. The first thing I would do is get the playability dead right. So get the frets leveled, the action nice and low, which is which is what Rohit wants. Um, and we'll get it set up that way. The second thing I would invest in was making sure the nut's right as part of the setup. But then come down to 
choice of pickups and unless there's something that somebody has as a, a kind of personal preference I wouldn't be going down the route of saying oh you must get one of these or one of those I would kind of say to Rohit this it, you know unless you don't like the sound of these don't go spending money on them stick with what you've got um, so it's really about playability making sure that there's nothing that isn't working we've got a hard tail bridge and string through um, and that looks all okay it looks set quite far back but again nothing about these um, the bridge and the saddles that are requiring any modification so really about playability of the neck smoothing those fret ends off reshaping them a little bit um, we can see here that this is one of those scary fender mexico well fender usa and mexico where they've sprayed over the frets and and yet they've done it in a way that's far cleaner than those meteoras that we saw coming out last week um, so they've done the same technique they've put the frets on on a bare board and then they've sprayed over it carpet spraying i call it and you can see that the what you get with that is a less than flat finish. You see how the reflection here kind of crinkles as it goes across. That's telltale sign of, of a not flat finish. Um, and that's because you can't get it dead flat if you're spraying the shiny bit, it's getting sprayed directly on. Now it goes on nicely, but it's always slightly organic because you can't get inside of there to flatten it off. If you did it the other way around and you um, sprayed all the finish on first, then flattened it in one surface then you get a much flatter and a more mirror like finish but you can see as i roll over you can see it's got all the organic gloopy spray so they haven't been able to flatten it off because you can't and think about the imagine the time and when you get in between frets like this you just simply cannot flatten it off sorry my fingernails look completely gummed up with cleaning uh, compound but anyway so you know you can see that that's that's a, the choice but it's amazing that they have removed far more of the finish on these frets prior to it going out the door than they did on the Meteora, which costs quite a bit more than this one. Anyway, so it's proof that even this method, even though it's not ideal for me, um, it is a fairly understandable commercial compromise, and that they can do it in a much more acceptable um, condition. Interesting that the wood in the neck has shrunk a little bit over time. Um, but that's what causes the legendary fret sprout. And to, to be fair, at this point, the end fill material, which would be some sort of paste or resin, has come out. Um, it's protruding, if I can hold it still. Um, it's, you'll sort of, uh, it's very hard to show it. You, if you see it at all, where the hell is the neck gone? Oh yeah, there it is. Um, yeah, if you see it at all, you'll see it sticking out it's pushing that little bit of fill out so it stands proud there and behind that is the tang that's going to pull out as well so it needs tidying up but it's just an indicator that the neck would itself shrink slightly now with that comes the question that we would then ask ourselves is since we know that the neck has shrunk and ideally you wouldn't want it to on a premium guitar although you might say mexico isn't necessarily premium but what you're sort of going to be slightly concerned about after that point is whether it's uh, in drying at all or in shrinking, whether this timber is good enough to withstand any twisting. And it looks okay from here, but shrinkage equals very likely, or shrinkage is where you will get twistage and warpage because um, and if you have uh, an, uh, a piece of wood with different grains in it, if you get what I mean. Um, so we could take the neck off this and you could see the end grain of this neck and it would hopefully be either perfectly quarter sawn or at least if it's um, on a slant, which it might be for this quality of build, you'd hopefully, you'd want to see all the grain lines straight line or parallel to each other, whichever way they're running. Um, and I can't really see if this is a one piece. Is this a, a one piece? Yeah, this is a, this is a, one piece so it's there's no fingerboard on here as such hence the skunk stripe on the back and what this means is looking at the end grain here it is diagonal um, but it's it's diagonal and parallel to each other so hopefully that's reasonably warp resistant right so let's just do a couple of the things we normally do which is let's check for neck relief now I think there's practically none in there and there's too little for my likings it's practically clinking out on the fret so let's just put in and I can see it and I look in here anyway it's got some 
it's almost back bow. So let's move the strings out of the way for a second. Now one of the reasons I'm slightly miffed, hello, what size are we looking for here? Slightly miffed about the um, JHS who have failed to deliver to me a bunch of my, my sort of uh, order, my tusk nut order, which is very annoying. Um, let me see if this is the, I'm looking for a bigger hex key. We are. This is the Martin, Martin? this is the Taylor Undoer. I don't quite know what it is. Taylor GS Mini uh, Bolt, Neck Bolt Undoer, but it also works for the uh, Made in Mexico. So we need to, oh, that is stiff. We need to knock it off. I've taken what might be 20 degrees there and you notice I wasn't in any fear of breaking the guitar or anything or snapping the truss rod but I've just added a bit more relief into it now I think I may have put a 10 uh, gauge top string on here but that's not the end of the world um, it's just a, a quick replacement that I had. Okay, so my first consideration is checking the relief here, and I would say that's about 0.2 mil, which is, I think, pretty good for. Uh, maybe this is. I got a feeling this is a. I think these are supposed to be nines. Let me just check. Oh, I'll check a bit later on. I'll work with what we've got on here. They may be 9.5s. So if I'm trying to recall. Um, anyway, so we're, relief is good for the time being. Let's now look at the, for, our, for interest's sake, let's look at the saddle height, the last fret action, as I call it. Now, have we got US style? Yes, we have the US style. Doofus, the Imperial what's it? The Imperial droids have entered the base. Name that film. Um, Easy to get. Now this is now currently sitting at uh, sitting about two, just, just about just a fraction under 2.5. So I'd say this is 2.25 low E. Write it down. My low E and uh, not much at all on the high E. So that's that's down too far. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna need to make adjustments full stop but so actually I don't really need to measure any further than that because what we're going to do is we're going to take this bass string down obviously there's some fret slap there which if we take it down any more anyway we're going to need to take care of and that's undoubtedly oh god this is a bit stiff undoubtedly what um, you know, Rohit's going to want done this this to be playable, but without any fret slap. So we're going to go aim for a one one point five nine point five millimeter standard. We'll start with one point five mils at the last fret, um, and kind of work our way across to one point two ish. Now that oh, that's fairly challenging playing action but should not be impossible um, I'll check the radius of this because I'm not sure about its spec but I don't think this radius should be um, anything other than the 9.5 um, yes yeah, so I'm annoyed because I was expecting a delivery of 9.5 inch uh, tusk nuts and they haven't bloody delivered them and, I, and a bunch of others besides I've got three outstanding for the Firebirds, um, the kits. So there's quite a bit of lowering going on down here, so the action was fairly high. Now, a lot of the time I can do this by eye um, to begin with, because you can sort of visualize kind of a curve. Um, and obviously, I, I've occasionally in the past have had people say, why don't you use a radius gauge across here? And the reason I don't use a radius gauge I've never done this while well, I'm fiddling with this. I've never done a straight on, full on shot, baby. Um, the reason the reason why I don't need to use a radius gauge is because if you think about it, 
the fret there has its radius, right? Let's call it 9.5. If I go uh, 1.5 millimeters above it for every string, then I'm clearly following the 9.5 inch radius, and you can tell that's a 9.5 inch radius. Yes. If I um, start with uh, 1.5 and go across and make all of them, or a mixture from, or blend from 1.5 down to 1.2, then it's still the same radius, but it's slightly tilted off to one side. Um, it's an offset radius, two off, uh, one curve offset from the other, and that's how I do it. So there's a 1.2 on the high E. That's too low. So I want about 1.25 here. It's kind of getting there. And then I want about 1.3, 1.35 here. And look in the light, please. Yeah, that's coming in close to 1.5, which is a bit too quick into that zone. And then about 1.4 here-ish, that's about right, and that's about right, it's a bit low this one, twink, it's very tiny amounts as you can tell, and this will be my playing action set. Now this is a, a lowest I ever go. Okay. So there's my basic action. I'll double check the the neck relief, and that may be just a fraction too much now. So what I'm going to do is just make absolutely sure about this. If I can find my <laughs> this thing, capo. It's a flat one, it's really a classical guitar one, but it's okay for using in the workshop for this purpose. And let's just see if I can... Sorry, the view has suddenly become stupid and rubbish. Doink. Let's see if I can measure the relief. I want about 1.5, sorry, 0.15 millimeters, um, but it's totally subjective. In other words, every player kind of will find a setting that they like better than any other. And that's currently higher than that, so I could take a little tiny bit out. Yeah, so, you know, it's a, people sometimes get infuriated when they come to a video and they're looking for it to be told what to do exactly. Um, and they say, how much neck relief should I have? And I would say, as I would start with a tiny bit more than none. And they go, what does that mean? Well, it means a tiny bit more than none. So start with none and then work away from none until it's it plays about where you like. But the important thing to remember, it's still higher than 0.15. Um, so we've got a bit more than we need still. It's not responding very quickly, this neck, or very immediately to my ministrations. Um, but it may be that it only does when we get into the, the full bite. Now to do that we have to move strings a bit out of the way. <sighs> um, yeah, so it's, you, know, the, you have to keep the rule of thumb in mind and that is you don't want no, you don't want no relief. Yeah. Sounds like advice from some blues singer. You don't want no relief, got it? Yeah, man. It's very hard to get this in without moving the string or even seeing if it's going in a level, but that's just about 0.15. So let's hold it there. Um, now the next thing I'm going to want to know 
sorry, before I move on, let's just say the thing about the, the relief is um, if you set the neck dead flat, then you have to give your strings room to move by through the raising of the action at either end. Um, but clearly, the fact that you can put a curvature in the neck allows you to give the strings a little bit of room whilst having a low action everywhere else. But of course, that means pound for pound that the action increases very slightly into the middle and then it will decrease up to the low for, uh, last rep action that you've set, or I've set here in this case. So you sh my advice is only adjust your neck relief when you are setting the guitar up and you're thinking about the rotation of the heavier strings particularly. And you see they move from side to side but they also move around, describe a circle if you like, and they need space. If you have a very low action and a very flat neck, the net result is you don't have much space and these will hit the frets all the way. How do you stop that? Well, you give it some action, but you still want a low action. So you give it a low action, um, and if you have a low action set here, you may still find that it's hitting the frets, and you may decide that you need a tiny bit more relief. How much more relief? Well, flat is the absolute minimum. Um, if you go past flat the other way, you get back bowed, and your notes down here won't play at all, and that should tell you you're back bowed. Um, flat on the deck, I would say, for a Telecaster on you know, round strings, you don't want it that uh, flat. Um, so I would suggest how much? A bit more than none. So you dial it until there is a tiny gap between the string and the eighth, roughly eighth fret. Well, fret. The, the middle part between these two, I'm holding it down on the first and last fret, and you can hear it's tapping down and there is a, a gap, and it turns out to be about 0.15 as it happens. That's a good starting point. So I would recommend that you work with that, um, but it is effectively a little bit more than none. But you may find over time that you prefer a lot more uh, a feel of higher action here and nice and low at either end. It's entirely up to you. So that's why you ideally need to be comfortable making your own adjustments. Now while I'm at it, the next thing I'm going to want to do is to um, put marker on the frets ready to level them because Straight away, I'll be able to hear if I could find the plectrum. Um, I mean, what problems have we got? Well, we got choke out. We also got yeah, choke out on these strings here. So let's let's record this for posterity's sake. We're bending on the eleventh fret, eleventh high fret bend on the E, on the high E. Okay, we're choking out on bends. Okay, so we want to free that up. Now, well, how do you normally free that up? Well, if you're not going to do any fret work, then you raise your, your action. Possibly, in this case, raising or increasing the curvature probably won't solve it because it's effectively bringing the tail end of the neck upwards into this gap here. So you may find it doesn't improve it at all. In fact, it may make it worse. So it would be cured by raising the last fret action, as I would call it. Um, or we can cure it by carefully leveling the frets. So that's the first thing. Uh, then typically the B string tends to be quite hard to choke out. So it's usually the E string as it gets across into what I call the G string track. So the leveling is going to be critical here where this, this string is choking out. And will be the great thing about the method I use is you're going to be able to hear this free up. And if it doesn't free up, then we have to compromise somewhere else but we'll see what we get. Now, the other thing that typically happens is you get what I call slap. It's that frazzly sound, rattly, persistent rattly. Mm. Yeah, there's a rattle of anything all the way up and it's it increases in certain play clusters but it's pretty much on most of the strings now i call that fret slap to distinguish it from fret buzz now on this guitar fret buzz would be either single notes that are choked off 
of which I can't find any immediately. Um, that's quite common on really badly fretted guitars. So no fret buzz of the old style. The only time we're getting fret buzz, although let's call it choke, is on the bends. That's dis displayed already. So we're choking out there completely dead. Um, but we're getting what I call fret slap. So there's three types really. I better add one to my dictionary. Fret choke, fret slap, and fret buzz. So I'm going to, when I'm working on this, we haven't got any fret buzz because nothing, no individual fret on a played note is buzzing. Um, we've got lots of fret slap. Now a, you'll hear why, or you may see later on why I'm making a distinction between fret buzz and fret slap. Fret buzz, if you want to know the working difference between the two, fret buzz is where it goes. Oh, I can't even make it buzz, but it buzzes on one note out of all of them, and you know it's an individual occurrence of a high fret. Fret slap, is, I call it fret slap because it's got that buzz, but it's on a whole sequence of frets and it gets worse in clusters and then it dies off, but it tends to it tends to follow all the way, or most of the way up the neck. So fret, fret choke, fret buzz, we haven't got any, and fret slap, we've got some. So we've got buzz and slap. Buzz and slap, let's do it. Um, what else do I need to do? Oh, yeah, I didn't measure the first fret action, but I quite a, quite like it, except it's a little bit inconsistent. So if I were to scoot all down here, can you still see what's going on? Use is the mirror. Well, OK, let's let's get a better zoomed in shot or something. Make it worthwhile having two blasted, blasted cameras going for all the trouble it's worth sound it doesn't I mean I can't tell I just have to hope that bad sound on this device was an aberration but we don't know anyway so I'm going to do a quick check on this now no yes it's on its back I'm setting ideally 0.3 and it's actually below that on some of these just about 0.3 just about the G is a little bit lower than everything. So re realistically, to make this one work, if we don't have an alternative, which uh, I've got, a, I think I've got, where do I put it? I've got a, a 9.5. Is it a 9.5? Let's just check. Oh, yes, a 9.5 in black. So we might we might just go for that as a, as a change out, because that's that will be, what do they call it? No, <laughs> obsidian. No, that's a silly word. Um, it's a that stuff. It's a anyway. So we, we'll we'll change that out um, because there are some black features. There's black pickup ring on there. There's a black tip to the what's it. So it's not a problem having a black one. That's the only 9.5 tusk I've got, um, which is lucky. I've got one at all thanks to non-deliveries. Anyway. So let's let's take care of that. So um, what I'll do for the time being is I will take off. Sorry, stand up, rumble. If since I'm going to re re replace this, might as well since we're going for tusk uh, on the what's it's as well string tree. Um, had, if I hadn't had tusk, I would have made the existing one work, um, which is doable. But it would have mean meaned I would have preferred not to be taking it down to point. 25 where the lowest one i.e. the G is I'd rather be have more room and be um, working to 0.3 which is my preferred target but that isn't the case so it's convinced me to um, to go with the uh, alternative now these these I'm going to take the strings off at this point partly because they're not they've not been put on um, they're not on uh, locking tuners, so I will be able to rethread them um, much easier. Um, and the reason I want them off is because out of the way, I can work on the nut better. I do need them on, obviously, to refit, uh, to get the nut to its exact correct height. Um, but now, some people have asked me recently um, why I don't use. Like, they haven't seen me using adjustable, custom-made adjustable nuts on, 
strats and tellies recently and one of the reasons is if I'm honest it's because I've got more proficient at getting them to the exact height from the bottom up um, so I leave the the factory slots untouched and the truth is before that I was struggling a little bit to it, it took me a lot of work to get anywhere near it and I would too often for my liking end up over cutting it and having to sacrifice the nut and start with a new one so it's kind of time consuming time consuming and expensive so the the adjustable one was in many ways a, a really good solution for me as much as anything because it meant that I could get the exact correct playing height for the first fret without um, any risk of uh, overcutting we were talking about such tiny distances if it overcuts then you know it costs a whole new nut and so on and so on so um, but to get this out then we have to be quite um, careful with the what can you see yeah you can see there so well this is this has been um, given a little bit of finish over it so it's got a kind of a wash of uh, slightly amber finish now I'm just kind of lining things up and uh, using two hands to get things done now people always say why don't you just tap the <laughs> tap the thing to get the nut out and I always say have you tried it it doesn't ever really do what you think it's going to do and to be fair I did it on the a previous recent one and I said exactly the same thing and tapped it and it made me look like a fool because it immediately popped out and made me look like somebody who was just making it up as he went along or I'd had one bad experience not being able to get a nut out and therefore I concluded that none of them ever came out with a with a, a, a sharp tap so I'm going to give it this option again to prove me entirely wrong and for the purposes I'm going to use a small screwdriver and support it as well as I can and we're going to say hey you've got every right now to tap out and prove me wrong well whoop de doo thank you Okay, let's just make sure this is the old uh, 9.5. That would be amusing. I've got 7.5s, funnily enough. It is 9.5. Um, but I do have more 7.5s than anything else. In fact, the truth is I've got more 7.5 right-handed. So I've got this little, little lip of what's it across there, for which I may want to use a specially prepared blade, which I used on the back of the... Thing, uh, when I was doing the repair, if I can just zoom in for a minute. So I've got a little lip of finish on there. So I now have a mm, a protected blade, which I should be able to run across here and avoid scraping the flat surface of the finish. <sighs> sort of. It's not as easy as it looks. Until, unless it unless it supports both sides it won't do what I'm trying to do with it <sighs> that's again it l makes me feel that that's been sprayed over with the the nut in place um, ideally what we really want for this is a shorter version of this so let's see if I can make a shorter version yes that's a bit shorter uh, yes, now I can su suspend it and lightly scrape. <sighs> That's not too bad. Thank you for your service. Doink, dead. Or temporarily disabled. Okay, <sighs> so what I now do is to make this whole business work, this is the bit I've learned over time, I'm going to make some very careful measurements and to have found out that you can do that is a pretty good thing so we want this is reading at 3.05 wide and we'll find that this is more than that to begin with so first of all we know this isn't going to fit without a little bit of sanding 
So that's the first thing I'm going to do is sand to get it fit width-wise. So I'm going to get my block of brass with a nice bit of slightly tired sandpaper now and I'm going to work off the one face of this to keep it as flat as possible. Now a small object like this is quite difficult to sand without it leaning on one side more than the other and how much you sand has got to be experience based, intuition based. 317 doesn't seem to have gone down, 311, 3, oh, tells a different thing every time. Come on, center off, zero off. 319, 319, it's lying. It's going back to 2, naught. What did we say on the other one? 305. This is saying 311 now. 312. Okay, we're not far off. Now, the reason <coughs> getting this part <coughs> is so important is because if you go too loose, it, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It tilts and it feels horrible or it, it can literally tilt over and, and feel unstable. Okay, so now we've got a pretty much an almost perfect fit. I'm going to do the slightest bit more um, about that much more. How much? That much. Um, because what I want to know is that it's going to seat in properly. Yeah, that's good. Now it's, <coughs> it's clearly too tall and it's a little bit wide but all tusk nuts are. So we're going to balance the spacing of the strings and what needs to be taken off either end, but we'll do that bit in a minute. So now we're, we're too tall. So the important thing is, is this is a, um, a curved base on this nut. So we're going to need to take off the curved part of this. And I'm going to do it with a, a, what am I, a thing I'm going to call it. I'm going to leave that there for a minute. You can look at me on the tall camera. I'm going to do it with this adrenaline spin thing, sanding drum. I'm just going to, oh, I can come back over here this type of thing and I'm going to run it and hold this very gently up to the spinning thing and just do my best to carefully take down the little tab sitting up. Now I can almost afford to um, you can afford a tiny margin of error there because as long as it's not sticking up, then it's it, it doesn't matter if it's slightly concave, you know what I mean, slightly too little, um, because it will support nicely, but we don't want it to be too tall. We don't want any sticking out still, is what I'm trying to badly say. So I'm going to just hand scrape the last little bit flush, so we have no standing up because that will just provide a little bit of a pivot point mm, still a tiny bit of standing up uh, a very fine piece of small sandpaper I'm just going to lightly sand here okay so yeah, so the, the getting the nut part is so important. Um, getting a nut right is so important that I would say it's where your tuning stability lies. Um, I say it's half the nut and half getting rid of the unwanted slack in your strings. And when you've done both of those things, you can enjoy um, consistent tuning stability. Okay, so now. I've got the nut seated lovely and firm. It's seated most of the way down, so it's perhaps a tiny bit too thick at this end, at the base end. So I'm just going to sand a little further and put a tiny bit more pressure on the base end if I can, just to thin that down a, a whisker. So this will sit in and go all the way down. That's it. Right, there's my proper seating seating plan 
Lovely. Seated. Now, that's the first step. So what we now have to do is we now have to put the strings back on and check the height of them. Now, to do this, I'm going to do a little bit of snipping and stuff because these strings were too long. That's one other thing, Rohit. You, it would do you good to have less string on the pegs. Don't need so much. Um, I'll show you when it comes to how, how I do it when we come to restring. I may have cut it too short now and I always end up paying the price for that. But I just, I want the strings on but without any, I probably have cut it too short by my bad luck. Oh God, why would I do such a silly thing, eh? Dole. What a silly chap. Now let's get hold of this. Hold on tight. I've given it a little bit of a backwards pull. So I may just have saved myself the horrors. I may not equally. No, I haven't saved myself the horrors of a new string required. Useless. Well, that's my mistake. I'm trying to cut some off because I didn't want to fiddle around. You can't see anything there. Sorry. Um, I was trying not to fiddle around so much, winding stuff back on. It's mostly difficult to get the coil bit through the thing here. Right. I'm going to try another approach, and this is my last ditch hope. Is pull it through as far as it will go, and wrap it round, and then we'll do the tuning. Get on there, sucker. Still ain't gonna want to go, is it? <laughs> oh lordy! Can I get it twisted under there? Do I stand a chance of that? And there you go. Grab. Maybe. my time I'm gonna to have to go and find a spare now. Idiot. Well maybe. Okay, but that was my my fault for coming off too much. But there's loads of extra space. I didn't want to be working with the coiled end bit. So I will take some off but not so much. I really um I can get away with that it being tight if necessary. Although, to be honest, I'd rather it was tight because I want to put it under pressure. So what I'm going to do, is I'm going to put that there. And while we've still got the strings uncovered, I am going to carefully mark them all with pen. Now, I say carefully because, obviously, we don't want to get the marker pen on the maple, the poly. However, it is poly finish, and if you do get some on there, then you can take a a cloth and a small bit of a dab of cellulose thinners will take it off perfectly and that won't do any harm to the finish which is doesn't react now you wouldn't do that if the finish was a nitrocellulose finish but you wouldn't expect it to be on this guitar but if you're ever in a situation where you have to check and be sure then you can do a test somewhere like on the back of the neck heel or something like that. It's always a good thing to do a test with some thinners and if you can dissolve or melt down the uh, um, finish then you clearly are dealing with um, if, if the finish kind of goes sticky or starts to break down then it's uh, a nitrocellulose. The reason I'm doing this is I'm going to put the strings back on and we're going to measure the gap underneath the beneath between the strings and the first fret and that will tell me how much I need to take down um, you notice I'm now not cutting these short anymore although I should do really but I'm just making them go back on and yeah so we'll measure the gap and then it will tell me exactly how much I need to remove Once we got that right, then I will go ahead and do the fret 
leveling and the key thing in the fret leveling is to be listening out for a reduction in what I call the fret slap of those strings because we set a lower action and that means basically we've increased we're likely to increase the amount of fret slap that was there before um, just be careful to bend these spare bits up oh. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll aim to decrease, if not remove, the fret slap altogether. That's the target. Sometimes you can't get rid of it altogether. It just is a space issue and you have to compromise if it's at a level that you, annoys you. Um, we have to make that judgment on the fly. Um, and then once we've, we've removed as much fret slap as possible, then we'll also be looking to free up, well, first we'll be looking to free up the, um, the choked out bends, that's the important bit. There's no point having a, an action set that plays on all the notes except chokes out when you bend it. Okay, so there's a bit of, um, uh, there's a bit of realignment we're going to do here when the time is right. Um, the other thing is the neck needs realigning. I don't know if you can see this very well. Let's see if you can. Where am I? Let's go central over the top. Um, it shows the E string. I'm, I'm about central over the top now, and the E string is clearly, uh, should be visible. I can't see through the holder, the bracket here. E string is too close to the edge here. That's going to be fixed by a little bit of adjustment on the neck, but we'll do that towards or a bit further down the line. So that's Put you over safely at that angle for a minute. I've got a party tonight, hopefully my dad's or this afternoon, so I'm aiming to get done. Um, and we'll head over there. It's his 80th birthday. Yes, my dad must be, must be, must, should feel very honoured that I'm foregoing a couple of hours in the hammock to go over <laughs> to his birthday party. You know how important that must be. Because um, it's nice outside, or there's not, I wouldn't say it's boiling hot. Now this is a situation now where this damn, they make them sometimes that the strings get caught up on a little ledge inside, which is really annoying. Okay, so this is going to be a little bit, uh, over tensioned, but I can deal with that for now. Are these loose? Okay. Okay. So I'm just using this for the mar the positioning as much as anything else. No big deal about it being over tensioned, I promise you. Yes, it's slightly over tensioned, but you'll see that as I slack the strings and move them around, the tension will vary, so it's never completely exactly the same as playing tension, but it's close enough to make the leveling process work out. So, 
just make sure we're in tune. Okay, so now what I'm looking for is quick assessment of the height of the action here. Um, it's quite a bit on that side and a bit on that side, but maybe not so much. So this is the bit that gets precise. So I'm going to draw myself a nut on the screen, on the thing. And I'm going to, I'm going to make a measurement now and see what we've got. Do we think it's 70 over? 0.7 over there. Well, yes, it is because it plays. Same there. Is it 80? Let's find out. 0.8, I should say. 70, 80. Yep, it's 80. Yep, it's 80. Uh, 80. Take 10 off, put 2 on. <laughs> 80, 90, just about 90. I'd say 85 would be a good, right, so it's 85, 0 0.85, 0 0.85, which is point, 0.55 over what we want. Yep, we want 0.3. So if it's 0 0.55 over, we're going to take 0 0.55 off the bottom of here. But you might say, how on earth are you going to do that? Because you'll never draw a line a half a millimetre thick and be certain. So what you do is you snack these off for a minute, take the nut off again. And this is why it's very important to be sure that the nut is seated all the way down at this exact point in time, because if it's not, we're going to be getting things wrong. <laughs> all over the place. Right, now here's the fun part. We move the guitar off to one side and we make a measurement of this nut. So we start with zeroed and we measure at the base slot, base E slot, and we get... Hmm, that's interesting. Is that saying it's not precisely level? It's kind of is, isn't it? Hmm. Okay, call it 3.5. 3.5 on that side, on the base side. And on the top side, we can't get into the slot, so it's going to be a bit more, but we'll make sure it rests on the slot for positioning. And that comes up at 3.95. And we want to take 0.55 off either side, minus 0.55. And therefore, we know what that equals. That equals 3.4 is the target on this side. 3.4 add 5.5 five is 9.5. Yes, that's right. And we take 5.5 five off there and it's 2.95 is the answer on that side. And we know it's the same amount off either side, so we just keep going level. Ah, but look, it's curved, you say. Oh, hell, that's a pain in the... Mm. Yes, it is. Now, it's so much easier to put those in and cut down on the nut slots, but... We're gluttons for punishments. So we get out one of um, Bob's fabulous tools of old. Clean off some of that doof. And now what we've got is a uh, block with a radius on it. I don't know what you can see here, but that's probably can. So we've got a block with a radius and I can cut away. Now, if you were really stuck, there are other ways you could do this. You could get a guitar neck with a nine and a half inch radius. Let's imagine, oh, I don't know, let's, uh, let's imagine it's this one. So let's say you were stuck and you didn't have one of these clever boxes. You could put some tape on there, some double-sided tape, and you could put a piece of what's it on there, and you've got a 9.5 radius to sand on. In fact, it might even be, hmm, let's just check this is, Actually, it's not. Of course, it's a Chinese thing, so it's not correct 9.5. But it would be easier because you can get hold of the nut either side. So if I had such a thing as a 9.5 radius, which, guess what? 
Typically, I've got no, no such vintage thing. Hmm. Wrong. Anyway, you could do it. Like, I've got a block, so I'm not going to do it. But you could get yourself a 9.5 inch neck, put a piece of tape on it temporarily and do it. Now, I've also got a little assistant here to help me in this process, which I hope is still around. Or, oh, here it is. Uh, is this the correct radius? Yes, a 9.5 radius. You see, I've used this before. So this fabulous little tool comes with, these are all computer printed, so it comes with a little block. Now this is how I use it, and it may be, may be incorrect, but this is how I've come to use it. It's a bit, I find it a bit, a little bit hard to handle, but, so I basically position that in there, and then I screw in the doofers, make sure it's as kind of equally balanced. Now it doesn't have to be dead equal because I'm not going to do it all the way down to flat flush with the um, plastic but I just want it roughly equals that will do hello tighten up thank you tighten up tighten up um, actually having said that the further in it goes to be fair the better a grip it gets so let's just try and leave only as much above ground as we need for the job at hand. Again, it's quite hard to handle because you've got to somehow hold the thing in place and do the thing up. So let's see if that's anywhere near. Of course I'm going to have to be able to remove this <laughs> so it's going to be a little bit. So what are we looking to remove? Oh yes, 0.55. So now I've got me two bits right? I can literally run this up and down here like so. Now it it clearly has the ability to rock uh, from side to side and so it, you know, there is a, a need to keep a close eye on the fact that it's got a square or perpendicular bottom on it and if it's not holding, if it's not held absolutely perfectly uh, it can still can go off square which is a bit of a worry. Now obviously at this point in time I have no means of measuring it so it would require me to take this off every few seconds and go back to measuring because this is all based around getting this measuring bit right. So I'm looking for 295 on the base side. I could have overcut it by now for all I know. Um, I know I haven't but right so down to 3.4 which is a fraction under what it was and here we are 3.89 which is down we're, so we're taking about a tenth of a mil and we want about five tenths so you can see that that's going to be quite a long-winded process that way the other way you can do it of course is to hold it like so and you know do it by hand up and down the radius so I'm, I'm kind of going from side to side on the radius here that keeps me in a fair amount of control I can hopefully uh, standardize the pressure downwards and I can keep an eye on the squareness of the bottom but this is going to either which way this is going to take me quite some time and that's why the adjustable nut can be very attractive because uh, it gives someone like me a chance to get this to the exact height now anybody else you might say it would uh, what am I looking at? where's my target three four yeah we're miles off anyone else you might say would um, start by just putting the nut in like we've already done and then uh, using the nut files to get it down to the correct first for action and to be honest when I'm doing a custom nut I have to do that so you know you will see me using the, the net the net nut files um, but the whole point of paying for a nice new tusk nut and having it fitted is so that you can benefit I think from the un file nut slots which are as they are molded straight out of the factory and that means that they're smoother along with the pre-lubricated material they're smoother um, to begin with so so this is now <laughs> this is thing is completely unreliable from what it's telling me all right it's not it's not two I've got to get to 295 and it's at 320 that's okay um, yeah, so you want the, ideally, that we're aiming for the un, 
un unfiled slots because whether you know the slots when you hit them with those Hosco files they are fractions ragged you know they're, they're not perfect cuts whereas these molded uh, slots are as the factory intended so we might as well try and benefit as much as we can from the sort of factory condition which is why I go to this trouble of getting the height from the bottom upwards um, so that's what all this is about and as you can see it is fiddly but it's worth doing okay we're on oh, we're about 295 here just about we're on the mark with the base side and we're three six we're about a tiny bit off on the treble side so I've got a little bit of extra pushing to do on the treble side which is again possible so we're just, I'm just going to hold it there and focus any work on that side only and we're talking tiny measurements now so we'd actually be fairly playable even if we just put it on like this but I want to get it down to the target mark Come on, get in there. Three, five, three, four is my target. Just check the squareness of it. It's good. So a little bit more um, manual scraping. I I have to say, while I like the idea of the gra the grabbing block, um, there's nothing like using your hands to be able to be in control of the process, um, and the fact of trying to kind of undo and replace the, the dufa we're almost on the mark uh, every time I want to check the, the measurement um, is a bit uh, what's the word demotivating I, I'm, I kind of prefer to be able to just hold it but it is a bit of an acquired taste art whatever you might want to call it skill so aiming it to get in to 348 we're nearly there 295 we're nearly there so it's all going well just a tiny bit more so hence the careful hand sanding and stuff is coming off so it is removing material um, now if you go off the square at this point you you are a bit stuck so if you go off the square you have to try and um, continue your sanding but also square it up which I think may be a little bit trickier at this stage in the game. Okay so move those out of the way let's have a look. You should be able to see okay still. Now sometimes when you take it down in height you get a situation where um, you also uh, it, it either sticks in the slot a bit or sometimes if you haven't got it down all the way in first it will then drop in place and you will overcut it or it will feel like it's overcut and there's nothing you can do about that other than except you didn't have it correctly fitted in the first place that's why it's very important to get it seated now I'm just going to check this Okay, so everything's seated the way it should. Let's double check the action on the top side and the bottom side. Get the metric ones. We want 3.3 of a mil, really. Fraction over. It's not bad. We'll do a little bit more, but we've also, don't forget, I need to do a tiny bit of removal of the excess on either end. Now the question is, how much is very difficult to say. We can do a measurement and then we can just guess. 
you know, and it's about how do you get the right amount off each end, and that really does end up being a bit of guesswork. So we can measure the width of the fingerboard. Come on. Thank you. So measure the width of the fingerboard. Um, Okay, we've got 41.82, and here we've got 43.5. I don't know whether that really helps you any or me any, who knows. So we know we've got to take some off the end. And now I'm going to, I'm, make, I'm working the, um, I'm still working the height of it, and I'm trying to put pressure to make sure it's square and that we're taking material off and I'm trying to also remove some off the end in a square fashion. So I said 4180 didn't we? 4180, 4310. I mean sometimes when you're in this situation it's a good idea just to take a bunch off by hand and get close to where you're going. Right, almost there, a bit more off this end. And once you take some off the end there, you need to, um, what do we say, 4180, so it's a little bit more. Yeah, you need to kind of round off the uh, ends as well, where they've been, and they're kind of sharpened because they were rounded before. So. If I get 4180, I will then hand round it off. 4180, there we go. So, let's just first of all, just round off these bits here so they're not sharp. Make sure that's clean. Right, now we still need to go down a little bit with the height. If we can, we can keep it going on the treble and bass sides now and keep it square. Lots of tongue out, concentration. And we're going to go for 3, 4 and 2, 9, 5. Square up please. 3, 4 and 2, 9, 5. 3, 4 and 2, 9, 6. I think we're pretty close. Back in here, nice and snug. Oh, that's very nice fitting, perfectly fitting. So, you know, measuring does work. Proof that maths works, or measuring at least. There you go. Right, so that has nearly everything taken care of. But next thing I'll do before we start tightening things up too much is I'm going to. I'm just going to put a capo on here and hopefully uh, we'll do a little alignment. So we need to bring, it's not very, needs to be in, stay in a straight line please, stay where your strings are. Thank you. Okay, so what we're going to do with the neck is we're going to pull the neck towards us, which is down, down this way. So I'm going to slack off and the right screwdriver bits. I'm going to slack off the screws on the back and then we'll loosen them off, move the neck, put a, tighten up one or two and then find our way to where the alignment should be. So just slacked off most of them and um, we can probably see it by so it wants to be down this way as much as we can go so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it under a little bit of pressure downward pressure like this and then I'm going to tighten up two diagonals with it under pressure and then I'm just going to take a look at it to be fair we can't get that much 
of an adjustment in because of the alignment of the uh, well the cut of the neck pocket so um, if it's too bad in the past what I've done is actually um, actually remove some material from the neck pocket but you stay there that's fine okay so now I'm kind of giving it a bit of extra tightening there we are okay so that alignment is now fixed take that off and check how high over here I'm gonna, I think that's is it? I'm going to double check. I want to get this right. Mm. Base side is right. The treble side is a fraction high. Oh, I'm not sure we're sat. Oh, are we sat in perfectly? No. See, that had a little bit of push to go. high but that's okay it's okay it's close enough I can maybe do a tiny a whiff more sanding once it's off um, in fact in fact there this this, uh, this one is just slightly that one's spot on it's the G it's a little high so after all of that I probably am going to need to make a tiny adjustment with the what's it the slots but it's you know sometimes that happens sometimes you get a slight inaccuracy in the tusk height of the saddles I'm afraid to say the uh, height of the slots but it's so it's it's a tenth of a tenth of a no yeah a tenth of a less than a tenth of a millimeter at issue so you wouldn't notice it but Let's leave it as is first. I think if, it's, if it plays well, I'm not going to bother cutting the slots any further or at all. Right. So I'll just get it in tune finally and then we'll do the levelling. Let's see how the, I don't know what's this doing, whether it will conk out uh, leveling bits. If I have to cut off this video, it's only because I have to rush to get out the door to the, the barbecue of the old man, the old man's barbecue. Right, so we are ready to go. So we're looking for some results in, first of all, bending out the high E uh, as it goes into the G track and as you can tell we won't know that's cured or fixed until we get there and right now we have to do the first the E track and the B track beforehand okay there we are we are calibrated there we go oh, we, don't forget we still got to put the change over the string tree to a tusk one right so this is uh, the process I use the curved leveling beam and 
it also it not only levels out the frets and smooths out the, the fret slap, uh, it also is very good at telling me a fairly quick glance, or it does a good diagnostic of what's going on with the neck. Um, so I can stand back from it and look and see where it's cutting. Um, so we've got a higher spot here, high spot there, um, and lowish, lower, right at the end. So it's not bad shape. It's just got, it, it sort of suggests a little bit of inaccuracy. Well, inaccuracy isn't the word. What it's really showing is the undulations in the fretboard. And they don't have that much effect on the, the high notes, high strings. So that all plays out perfectly. I'm not going to need to do any more with that track um, because all the notes are playing perfectly. Uh, the B track, same applies. And we're just going to level it to make sure that we just take care of any humps in the uh, process or in the, in the fretboard. It's interesting that in a way that the E and the B leveling is often really the sort of diagnostic part of it because those are much more tolerant. Now the other thing is there is a chip on one of the frets down here that I'm hoping to clear up at the same time. Yeah so so because the high strings don't move as much and they're much more tolerant and don't choke out as much in their own tracks um, then they're, uh, they're, they're quite tolerant and they just serve as a really good diagnostic. The, um, taking care of the, the ding already. Um, yeah, I think we have. That's good. Can't find it. I think it might have been there, but it's gone. Right, now the interesting one is where oh, I'm going to do actually a tiny fraction more there. Um, there was just a little hint of. Uh, what would I call it? A tiny hint of slap around the 12th to the 16th ish. So I'm just going to sort of rework those a tiny bit. Now I'm using a 400 grit paper on this tool so it's a very oh, it's a relatively slow leveling process. Now we know that we've got the next problem coming up and this is where we're going to hear the improvement this system makes or this method makes. We calibrate for the G track now and in leveling the G track, and I need to curve this a tiny bit more now. In leveling the G track, what we'll see is that we should free up that choked out bend on the high E. Now this high E is going to be difficult to bend now because it's a bleeding, it's a it's a B string from a 10 gauge set. So I'm going to it's going to kill my fingers to even bend that close. But we we should be able to hear it. So this is now a kind of critical track. Because it's, because it's at the top of the hill, um, in terms of the fret radius, or fingerboard and fret radius, because it's at the top of the hill, this is where the bends get caught out, because of the basic geometry of pushing the strings uphill. Um, so I tend to have to do a little bit more work on the, uh, on the G track than, than before, um, only because it's more, it's where the, it's where any slight, unevenness chokes out the high E bends. So we had the uh, the 11 bending up was choking out there. So now I can tell where it's choking out. It's choking out uh, at this point to the north side of the G track on the 12th fret. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to that spot and concentrate on it a little bit more with the tool. So when I mean when I say concentrate what I mean is I'm going to Kind of stay on the this side a little bit, and I'm going to put a little bit more pressure down right on that spot to even out the frets right there. Um, all I'm looking to do is is free up that bent note, bending note for the action that we set on here. Now the action is is low, so I'm not too bothered if I have to if I'm forced in the end. To raise it a tiny bit and I'll double check 
because if that E is starting off unrealistically low, um, uh, <laughs> I should have done a check. You know, it's too low now. And the reason it's too low is because um, the neck is, I don't know, having moved the neck, it seems to have slightly adjusted the way it's sitting. So we need to raise this a tiny bit, which is fine. We'll go back to where we were when we first measured it. Note to self, if you move the neck, check the setting again on the playing action. It can make that much difference. Okay, we well, want to go up to the 1.2, which is where we are. And a tiny bit more on this one. But other than that, it's about right. That will also help the action at that end. Right. Hey. Cleared. I mean that that's where we measured it before. It was at 1.2, which is the target action. This is right. It's very low. I just cleared it. So good, happy. Let's go on to the D's and the A's and the E's. So a little bit complicated that demonstration because it, the action had changed very slightly um, on the high E. But having reset the high E to where it was when we did the original test, um, you could hear that we'd, that piece of leveling had scooped out the, uh, the bit that was causing the choke on the bend. So now my sort of mindset at this point switches. All right, so we're not going to be bending any individual string across the, over the top of the hill into this part of the neck. Um, even if you, you know, whenever, whenever you want really big bends, you're never going to get, if you want a three tone bend, you have to have a, a certain action. You can't have a low action because you're going right up the hill and over the other side and there's a geometry of curvature which is going to obstruct the string unless it's really high. So um, working at a, a sort of decent action for a tone and a half bend um, on the E, then we can stick to this sort of action, but higher than that, is, uh, bigger bends than that require a higher action. It's not bad at all. Um, do a tiny bit more around the G track. Now, when I said I'm thinking of it from the point of view of um, re alleviating fret slap. What I'm now doing is I'm trying to lighten my touch on it and I'm trying to let the curvature in the tool impose itself across the whole of the thing onto the frets. But I am focusing on one point, um, but I need it to do all the points and I need not to bend it. So it's a kind of, it's a bit of an instinctive thing about how to, when to, when to press and when to leave it to gravity. I tend to lighten up when it comes to tackling the fret slap as I've described it because I want the I want to at that point I want to try and impose the curvature as set by the tool onto the ups and downs slightly hilly ups and downs of the neck and that requires less force which tends to straight straight risk straightening out the tool and we need more repetition and lighter touch to cure the fret slap. So here onto the thicker strings where the, the slap is really much, much more pronounced on the neck. Um, I'm now looking for a, as light a touch as I can get really um, within reasonable limits that we've got to get it done. Um, but I do, I'm, my mind is thinking imposing this perfect curve of the tool onto the imperfect curve of the neck or the fretboard. So that's what I'm thinking of at that point. And so I'm listening out now for Only bit around 10, 11, 12, but it's much better than it was. And then we'll get on finally to the 10, 11, 12. So now at this point, I'm sort of carrying on doing the same thing, but I'm, if I'm putting any downward force at all, it's a tiny bit more around these frets that I just identified. And whilst letting the rest still 
do what they have to do across the rest of the frets. You can't, I don't advise doing any spot leveling where you just focus on one. Whenever I'm focusing on a spot, the rest of the bar is also doing its thing. Now, this is just to remind you, that's fret slap all the way up there, second half of the fretboard. So that's where we're going to be focusing on. So we're going to calibrate again, worth doing every single time we can, apart from the E and B because we can't go north of the E, so we have to use the same one twice to begin with. Um, but I want to get this right. Now that needs a little bit more curvature. And the amount is minuscule and it becomes something that you feel over time and you get it just about right. So now thinking fret slap, not fret level or even fret choke, I want to level out. I'm trying to think of getting this smoother curve onto that roller coastery actual fretboard which is imperfect and we know it is because we can hear that fret slap so i'm kind of going side to side a little bit getting right to the edge of the e uh, track and then back in and i know it's worse in the second half so i'm going to sort of focus my psychic energy oops, on the second half of the fretboard a little now this, yes, it will take some fret metal to achieve this. And you can see there's, there's definitely a, it's actually cutting in the second half, telling us what we already know, which is there's a lot of up and down here. This is groups of frets standing out higher than the surrounding environment. But when we get it, tiny bit left really around the, that top end around the 12th and again I'm going to now do a little bit more and this is where I'm going to press down a little bit as I do it around the 12th 10 11 12 13th fret and this hopefully this last little bit of leveling here will clear up that last bit of fret slap but it's a very low action tellies for some reason them often don't like the low action. Well, that's nice in tune, but I'm going to do a little bit more after there towards the end, and that will be it. And I'm going to change its direction for good measure. So I'm just going to focus on this last strip uh, after about the 14th, 15th. I'm just going to take a bit more down there. Um, there we go, should be lovely, lovely. Nicely out of tune. I need to do a tiny bit more on that 12th still, but the ones above there have cleared up, which is great. Let's do a little tiny bit on that 12th fret, a bit more, and then we'll call it a day. Yeah, the, the amount of leveling um, is not huge really it's 400 grit um, and for a kind of first time leveling on this guitar because it doesn't appear to have been leveled before it's fine right I'm gonna call that that part of it done what time have we got holy cow it's two so I'm going to run out of time soon I've got about half an hour should be okay what I want to do in that half an hour is now take the strings off I'm going to crown Recrown the frets any minute now. Hopefully you're still running, both cameras. Things off. I don't actually need to glue this nut in. 
which is good. I'm going to leave it exactly where it is. Perfectly fitting and it's perfectly tight enough. These springs have done their service now, so they're going on the bend. And I think when, when I've done the crowning, I'm going to need to polish out the frets, which means I'm going to need to uh, turn the camera off, do a bit of recharging, um, and do the polishing and uh, all the masking off business off camera, um, which saves your watching time. And it means I can listen to the radio or something. Um, but I need to, I also have to calculate whether I do the final tweaks on this tomorrow and whether I bring it back up and film it or whether I string it at home and do intonation at home, either which way. Because I need it needs to be heading on its way back on Monday morning. And I've got quite a bit else to do this weekend as well. Well, I've got firebirds to wire up, all five of them. Mm. Okay, so that's that. Let's, let's head on into the recrowning business. The recrowning business. So, having leveled the frets, um, we've put a flat spot on them, and now it's going to be a case of beep beep. It'd be a case of um, just rounding off that flat spot so that it uh, resets the shape of the fret into a, a nice arch shaped because currently the frets have a small flat spot on them from the leveling which is a natural outcome of leveling them um, and we will reshape them in this process and the marker pen helps me to know uh, that I haven't um, I haven't I haven't I done I haven't um, taken the fret height down any so I use a tend to use a a little brush at this point in time as well to help me um, declog the thingy, <laughs> the uh, crowning file because it's it's getting older now, and it can well I I don't want it to get clogged up with pen because it sometimes does. So there we go, and the purpose of the file is just to round off the flat spots, and then we stop once. We've got the thinnest possible line down the centre of the fret, um, and that's when we know we haven't lowered the height of it any, and therefore the relative levelness will be preserved. And that's why the, the marker pen is a really good um, technique for that. So, as, you, as I'm going through fairly quickly, that, that will tell you how little material has actually been removed from the frets. Up there at the other end, it will get a little bit, will slow down a bit. Uh, where we've had to take a bit more to achieve the, um, the leveling effect. But right now, and once you once you if you use this method, you you get used to uh, trusting this part of the process to confirm to you how much metal you actually re removed or didn't. Because sometimes you can panic and think you've taken a lot away, um, and you get used to this bit confirming how much you did or didn't take and in this case it's going to confirm what I know which is I took more from this end of the neck than the first half um, but even still it's not that much all told because um, I'm whizzing through them fairly easily occasionally you'll come across a, a guitar with one fret that has to be really heavily uh, leveled out and and you'll see uh, at this stage you'll be spending a fair bit of time getting the getting rid of the flat parts now after this I will get a cloth and some cleaning fluid cleaning fluid and clean off as much of the marker pen as is possible this won't be the cellulose thinners this will be just using naphtha at this stage um, once we've cleaned most of the pen off, which comes off with naphtha, by the way, um, then we'll go to uh, masking it all off with masking tape, which will be off camera because it's boring. And I'll have to decide whether I cut my losses and run for today or whether I have time to finish this. All that's left to do after this is to re 
um, is to polish out the frets and to uh, what do I have to do? Uh, fit the string trees, and then I put new strings on, stretch them out, and uh, intonate them. usually end up seeing a little bit of dust here where I've scraped the frets and the black pen at the same time. Okay, so first of all we'll brush off the surface dust and then we'll get some cleaning fluid. Um, yeah. And then it will be, it's the easy part in a way now, the hard work's done. Fitting the nut and um, le precision levelling the frets is the harder part. This, um, this pen is evil stuff, it does not like to stick, so sometimes I think you have to do it once over with this to get as much as you can off, and then if there's any left behind you can do it by application of a bit of cellulose but thinness but actually it's, it's all right it's not bad so we're trying at this stage just to get the pen off the side of the frets so that it's all gone by the time we come to polish them out it looks nice afterwards and you see that there is a lot on the sides because it will come off on the cloth like so. The, the naphtha stuff is a good solvent and it will take off this, um, it's the best one to use to take off pen marks and stuff, but if they are really stubborn and they definitely won't come off, then cellulose will, thinners will, will do the final lifting job, but it's right, it's good and proper to be cautious of that at all times. Now the other thing I am cautious of, and I didn't mention this to Rohit when we spoke, but you may have seen it from other videos, is that the Mexican fenders have had in the past had a an adhesion problem um, in that for some reason or other the uh, the um, uh, some batch of the, the material, the finish, the gloss finish that they used, for some reason there were certain batches that just did not stick properly. Um, and as a result, they, uh, you, they, they can stay on for a long time and appear to be no problem. But then suddenly, either when you're doing the polishing out with um, using um, masking tape for example or um, you know, some other tape they can suddenly surprise you by the finish all flaking off which is really unwelcome surprise um, so that is an occasional possibility and I've had it happen once in a while on these things and it is pretty depressing when it does happen because uh, it's rare but when it does happen you have no choice but to um, but to refinish the fingerboard um, and it has to be done the same way it was done in the first place which is by uh, spraying over the frets because you can't take the frets out and start again unfortunately so what I'm doing here is just slightly widen the hole for this string tree because the last thing you want to do is to fit a string tree and have the, the different sizes of hole cause um, any splitting in the headstock that's not a nice price to pay so that's half a pack of tusk string trees, which is adds up at about seven quid, including postage for half, about 14 quid. Prices on those things are always going up amazingly. I'm just gonna, last thing on camera before I probably find that we're running out of batteries or something. Let me just tighten these to make sure they're tightened up. A bit loose. Often happens over time from you um, the finish shrinks a little bit and we know the woods shrunk a little bit so it's 
hardly surprising that you'll get some room to tighten there. Now, with regard, just as a little observational thing, with regard to the, the uh, what's it called, fret sprout, come, come here. Looking at the fret sprout, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to see how much it's not a bright here and see if, what I can do in terms of improving it here. The problem with this is that you can take away the little lump of end fill um, and you probably end up connecting with the tang because that's really what's sticking out when all said and done. Uh, so that's a consequence or that's what happens when it when the wood in the neck shrinks um, so that you're trying to just smooth it off with as little uh, damage as possible but of course it, it is pushing itself it has pushed out the finish so it's already begun that process we're just trying to tame it a little bit of course what it really means is now is that the fret as as it now sits doesn't need any end fill because the tang is now right to the edge of the wood. So in a way that is a fair bit of shrinkage involved um, because beforehand there was enough uh, there was enough space between or gap um, for their need for there to need to be an end filler put in. Um, so I'm just trying to smooth it out as best I can to prevent any sharpness. Now I'm going to also use the other file just to round off the ends of the frets themselves because they, they feel a little bit on the sharp side. So it's all about comfort and playability and I know that's Rohit's primary concern for this guitar. He wants it to be his kind of main guitar. Um, so Playability. Now, at this point out here, I'm going to leave these top few because they are very close to out of reach. Kind of, you can see, you can just about still, you can still feel it a little bit. It's very difficult to do this without um, working on the fret ends or well, without without damaging, we have to damage the finish, but um, I don't know whether it's better to sand all the way up here or just try and do, I might have to do a little bit of both because in order to round these off, it does take a, takes a little bit, carves into the finish a little bit, um, which then itself can be felt. So it needs to sort of be just evened out slightly. I'm trying, I'm trying my best. You can sort of see, I mean, maybe I'll see where suddenly you start to see shiny metal and that's the sticking out bit of the tang, which wasn't there in the olden days when they first shoved this out the factory door. Well, you shall see how much we can, how little we can get away with doing to it. You can, you can always hear when it's connecting with the metal tan. Yes, yes. I'm already merely, merely, nearly. Okay, I got a feeling that I'm going to have to do the dog. Not the donkey, do the dog. Make like a leaf and tree. No, tree and leaf. Um, maybe I can still do all the masking tape part, which is boring and time consuming. What side is this? This is the top side. Can we actually feel anything up there? Probably not. Right, so that's what I'm going to do for there. Uh, I'm going to get the other one, if you can see. Oh, well, let's look at this, but we, low battery. Uh, right, I'm going to have to stop this now. Come back when it's time to restring. Back again. Um, yeah, I ran out of batteries yesterday, so 
Uh, I stopped in a hurry. But since then I have uh, polished, sanded and polished out the frets. You can see everything's deliciously clean and sparkly. Doink. Um, yeah, all ready to go. Everything cleaned up, guitar cleaned over. So really now it remains, well not just remains, but it's time to uh, fit the strings, put the new strings on. So I'll show you how I do them. And this is row hit. This is my way of stringing them. So you get enough material on the um, pegs, but not so much as to store up trouble in terms of uh, slack. Because remember my mantra, that is the unreleased slack in your strings is 50% of your tuning stability and the condition and uh, material that your nut slots are made of is the other 50%. Nothing to do with the tuners, Ma, amazingly. Um, you may notice that I'm filming, you know, I'm recording the sound with the, uh, the camera itself um, rather than the head, map, head mic because for some reason that's suddenly gone down in output so it's about 50% volume. So yesterday's video we will need to boost the volume a bit artificially which is a pain um, and then today's will be straight off the camera. The, the, benefit of using the head mounted thing is that I can obviously get the sound. The voice level stays consistent wherever my head is turned. Obviously with the camera, it gets louder when I point myself at the camera or the phone itself. So a bit more consistent with the head mounted thing, but you know, I've been using it now for about seven years or something, six or seven years constantly. So it would be, Hardly surprising if it has kind of reached the end of its little lifespan. Now, here I am still trying to get the strings through this, uh, through this hole in the top high E. It's a little bit, it really is a little bit troublesome, that high E. It's because often the holes that are drilled are a little bit offset. Thank you, let go. Um, you know, to make sure that they line up, they, they often are, they can be drilled offset. Right, so I'm going to use my <coughs> thing here to line up all the holes on the tuners so that I'm easier to thread. <coughs> so here is what I do. I put the string through the, through the thing. <laughs> um, lift them up at the back to make sure that the ball is all the way through and then I pull them tight and then hold them and I pull them back one fret from the nut and then I start winding and I hold the string tightly and guide it in the first instance this is the loose string this is the held string so in the first instance the held string goes over the loose string like that as it comes round I stop and I yank the loose string up and I press down and guide the held string under the loose string this time round. And there we have it. So that's got barely two winds on there, but it sort of locks off the string in the middle. So that's a, a nice little lock for very little uh, string wound onto the post. And we do that all the way up for all of these same principles. So make sure it's up in the, through the body of the guitar to the nut, pull back one, start going, hold, tighten, slide over the top of the loose one, as the loose one comes round, to pull it up, and direct the held one underneath. And then snip off. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to put all these strings on, we're gonna then do the stretching. So if you remember what I said, tuning stability, 50%, the slack in your strings, unreleased slack in your strings, and 50% condition of your nut. We've got the nut sorted already. Now we're going to take care of the slack in the new strings, and that's going to take a good few minutes of deliberate stretching. But it's absolutely worth doing because it beds the strings in and it stretches all the 
slack out of the system so that they really will go into tune easier, easier and stay in tune easier, better. Uh, and you'll be amazed how much more likely you are to take the guitar off the wall, off the peg, when it stays in tune all the time. And so I, before I kind of realized how, how much um, stretching this took, um, I'd never do it. I'd stretch it a bit and get on and play. And then I, you know, I didn't know about the nut either. And that combined with the slack in the strings meant that my guitars would go out of tune and drive me mad. And then finally in my life, I discovered this. And uh, ever since then, I have had tunes, guitars that stay mostly in tune. And interestingly, when if I think I've got it, so my, if I've made a guitar and I think I've got it, so it stays in tune, but it, in reality, when I start to play it, it still resists it, then I know I've got something wrong. Even if I thought I got the nut right, I have to discount it and get rid of it, <clears throat> put a new one in or adjust it until it's perfect. So, you know, the fact that it's not staying in tune tells me I haven't achieved what I thought I had. So I guess what I'm saying is that it always will work if you do it right. So I'm gonna, again, hold this one taut over the top, underneath. Now the thin string goes round once or, once or so more until it tightens up um, so it's, you get a bit more on the <clears throat> thin strings but it's better that you do don't try and adjust it and, and reduce the amount of string that goes on it's better to have three loops in total because the only point at which your tuning can get uh, unstable is if you haven't quite got enough around the um, enough of a plain string around the posts and then there is a small risk that that can come undone or slip out it's just there's not enough grip so what I'm doing now is I'm just getting everything a sort of initial tug to settle it in or bed it in um, and then what I'll do is we'll tune it up now these are a <coughs> set of nines so I'm going to need to be careful when pulling on the thin high E string because we don't end up breaking them and you can do but the fear of breaking them shouldn't, isn't enough reason not to do this stretching. Yeah, you still need to do it. So now what I'm going to do is having tuned it up, I'm now going to take finger and thumb and go up and down the strings, pushing the strings with the fingers and thumb. So it's really stretching between that much, not at the ends over the sharper bits like the saddle and the nut. So it's putting most of the pressure on between thumb and fingers. And so physically going up and down and what will happen is that it, this will put the guitar out of tune again and we'll be able to note how much out of tune it is and um, now if you think about that the amount it goes out of tune is the amount we've pulled it out of tune in one go and it may be as much as in total a tone or even two tones in total and if you think that each string has one to two tones of detuning in it and that a few cents is enough to make it sound terrible on one string. You've got all the strings and all the number of 10 cents that go into up to two tones on every string to, to slowly, naturally come undone to put your guitar out of tune. And all of that will keep on leaching out 
months and sometimes even years. So this setup that I've done is a low action all the way through um, with actually a pretty flat neck relief at the moment. And maybe we could put a little, we may need to put a little bit more curvature in because these are now nines. So I think the previous strings on there felt like tens to me. Um, although I'm sure Ro hit, will have put them on if he likes nines. They probably were nines, but they felt a bit heavier. Um, but if, that, if that's the case, then it would benefit from um, just checking or adjusting the relief a tiny bit more. So I'm gonna give it another stretchy stretch and then we'll see how in tune it stays. The slots in the tusk nut need to be uh, deep enough to withstand any bends and they, they are pretty well good enough to do that. If they slip at all, we may need to look at deepening the slot fraction just to make sure it holds the, the, the string so that bent but that was under quite that slipped off but it was under quite a lot of pressure so so maybe two or three of these sorts of thorough stretchings are required um, and the more you do in, in principle you want to do it until it stops going out of tune that's the target Interesting, that's choking out there, which maybe we need to adjust the overall height. Again, having changed things around, let's see what we've got. That low E looks very low. Yikes, it is. Hmm, interesting. Now we've done a lot of sanding and stuff with the strings off, and it is possible that these grub screws when you move the guitar around the grub screws rotate so this appears to have got a bit lower uh, which has caught my eye why we're not we're getting choke out so i need to raise this up to the 1.2 ish that we were aiming for and check all the others it's still quite low far too low in fact but uh, here we are at the correct height there we go that's a bit of a shock when you when it's moved and you don't realize it so don't panic when that happens these are quite easy for the screws to move around even though it doesn't seem logical you shake the guitar a tiny little bit and they do move up and down Um, obviously, they don't do that with the strings on, but it can definitely can do it with them off. Because there's nothing holding them in place. So a bit fiddly, but we've got to get there. That's about right, and that's. Let me see. Turn it over. Okay, 
so I'm going to give it one last little gentle tug. Delicious. Okay, final part of this whole thing is the intonation, and for that we need the tuner and the cable. And the intonation is a physical property, so it's a distance business. It's a distance business. Um, and each string on a guitar needs its own specific, precise playing length of string. Now the, the uh, guitar is built around a standard so that parts can be made interchangeable and so on. So you have a standard setting, which on the guitar like this is 648 millimeters. But you tend to find that the actual length, the only string on this that is exactly 648 is the high E usually. And then the others back about a millimeter or two away as you go down with a jump forward on the G. So it's two groups of three, um, patterns of three. So E, B, G, E backwards a bit, B backwards a bit, G, D, A and E, the D steps forward of the G and then goes backwards for the A and the E, you'll see it in a minute. So we do it by sound, not by measurement, or not by distance, I should say. So we ping the harmonic at the 12th fret of our string, and we tune it to a perfect E, and we fret it. That's spot on. Now that means that's the correct length for this string. We do the same with the B string. Fraction sharp. Now I can see that because the um, the saddle is slightly too far forward. I could, knowing that the high E was in position, I could set the others all off the high E without worrying about it. Um, but I'm going to do it. Oops, I'm going to do it this way. I am going to do it, so I'm going to slack off that one a bit. just makes it easier. So I'm going to take the B. What's it standing on? B's got, it's, the B is up on one leg for some reason. Uh, actually, don't quite know why that, there it is. Um, so what I can do is I can actually, if I show you, now we're here, now we're here. So, now we know that the E is in the correct position. Oh, hold on a sec. We want the B to be about a millimeter and a half back. Same with the G. Then we want that one forward of the G, which it is, and then back and back. And they're about right. But what, let's say we didn't know if they were right. What we can do is we can um, do them because we know the E is in the correct place. So I, I knew the B was out. It was too sharp. It means it's too far forward. The whole string length is too too short and I'm going to pull it forward sorry pull it backwards that way if you like um, and I'm going to do the same for the G which now appears to be a fraction too short so I'm taking my Q off the high E which I'm confident is in the right place and the others I want to space the correct spacing I think the others are uh, pretty much on Having moved them, the ones that I think needed moving, that's how now go by ear. Now, if you do undo slack off the strings a little bit, they will need a tiny bit of stretching again to get back into tune because there's a bit of slack it reintroduced. Now, e is good. Um, the B is now spot on. Tune the G up. G is on. Now 
and D is on, A is on, and the E is on. Perfectly intonated. So there we have it. The telly set up and done. Now it looks like I'm going to be doing some more. It's a bit loose. It's just held on. It's not dropped off. It's what it's around. Um, looks like I'll be doing some more work for Rohit shortly because first thing this morning I got a message from him showing a picture of his um, precious Gibson BFG Les Paul um, with a broken neck and it looks like his his son knocked it over this morning which was heartrending I can imagine um, so it looks like that'll be coming to me so watch this space because that'll be an interesting repair to do so here we have it all the things done um, repair on the back done and polished smooth. You couldn't feel it actually. There's no way of feeling that. Um, in a way, I was, I was thinking about or saying this to talking about this with Claire today. Um, I was saying that this repair, when you can still see the little repair, in a way, it's it's not great that you can still see it because in a way, it would be we would all like the repair to be invisible. Um, but it's very difficult to do with. Uh, finish unless you can get the exact finish match this then you'd have to paint wait quite a long time for the paint to cure and then try and fill the remainder with the clear stuff and then blend it in with the finish so obviously that's what um what i've done but without the paint part so it is visible uh, but where that kind of repair really makes a difference is on the neck so you, you know if it's a repair that you can feel you don't want to feel it so uh, a puddle filled with crystal glass as I call it um, even though you can see that there was a ding there is is perfectly good because you really can't feel it anyway um, doesn't get in, in the way of playing so yeah done the filled that um, tighten the jack socket reposition the neck done the fret ends and taken away all the little uh, sprouty bits fitted a new custom uh, a new nut tusk nut fitted a tusk string tree um uh what else um yes that's about it really um oh and precision leveled the frets to lower the action and get back all the um choke free notes and get rid of most if not all of the fret slap slap also there was a ding on one of these frets up here which we've got rid of in the leveling process so very happy with this outcome it's a great looking thing um and well, it's ready to go into the case, possibly pack it a bit later on tonight. I'm running on a late one today because <laughs> amusingly, I lost a week and I was assuming I had a week less than I had for all the work I've got on. And I I basically closed down one of my, I come to the end of one of my work books, um, my kind of job to do list book. And um, I opened the next one and at some point I'd gone forward a page and, and I'd left it on that page and I then came back to it, assuming it, it was already open going from the old week. Here's the first day of the new week. And I carried on working to that. So I'd see the end Sunday, the end of the first book, jumping forward. There's Monday. And on Thursday, I was going up to London. Well, I'm not. It's a week. I've lost a week. So or I've gained a week. So it's next week I'm going to London, which means I've got time back, which means I had the luxury of only finishing this tonight and a couple of other little things. Otherwise, I would have been wiring up firebirds. But that's it for tonight. Um, um, yeah, I'm very chuffed. I've gained a whole week. It's something you rarely do, especially when you get to my age. So I'm looking forward to um, being able to work at just a little bit of a slower pace. Anyway, thanks for watching. Rohit, I hope you enjoy this guitar. It, it fulfills the ambition of becoming uh, a favourite of yours. And um, I look forward to seeing the BFG Gibson shortly.